Welcome back to Skeptics and Seekers, everyone. I'm your host, David Johnson, the Skeptic, and I'm joined by the other guy. Yep, so I'm, I'm Dale, the representing the Christian or Seeker side. And if you wouldn't look there, we've got yet someone else in the third chair this week. We have got Gary Habermas. And uh, Gary Habermas, uh, again, pages and pages of accolades. I simply call him the Dean of Doubt. I don't know how he feels about that title. Uh, But we're going to give Gary a chance to uh, introduce himself. I'm going to step back uh, as a host today, though, because I want to be in conversation uh, with Gary. And uh, I'm going to let Dale take over the mic, and uh, he will uh, take it from here. Sure. Uh, Yeah, so in in the first place, welcome welcome to the show there, Gary. We, We love to have you. Well, guys, glad to be on with you. This is an exciting sort of a uh, repartee back and forth, and I think those are needed times and useful times, especially in our society. So I welcome the opportunity. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, yeah, for, for those, uh, as David alluded to, Gary Habermas is a famous uh, Christian apologist and, and scholar. Uh, he's you know famous for his minimal facts approach on the resurrection, uh, but a whole host of other topics. Uh, as well as the one that uh, we have him here to talk about today, uh, a discussion on the nature of doubt uh, and what implications uh, doubting has uh, for Christianity. Um, so, yeah, just uh, before before we get started, Gary, if you had like a couple minutes just to sort of introduce the audience to, to who you are, um, you know, give any plugs that you'd like to for, for any sources or work that you're you're doing at the moment and... Uh, then we'll we'll get straight into the program on doubt. I know that you have three books on doubt, Gary. So maybe be sure to be sure to talk about those. I do. Yeah, yeah. Mostly my my area of research for over forty years has been the question of whether there is evidence for anything religious, and not just uh, Christian, because for the uh, longest time. I mean, years and years, I uh, toyed first with the idea of of naturalism and there being no meaning in life. And when you're buried, that's the end of it. And then uh, later, while researching the resurrection of Jesus and um, doing my Ph.D. dissertation on that topic, I became enamored with particular claims in Buddhism and uh, even told my mother on one occasion uh, that I thought I was drifting toward uh, Buddhism. And uh, I don't know if I used the word convert, but I basically said or meant that in about three years, I might, uh, three years, in about three months, I might find myself um, in that camp. And uh, so anyway, I, I've gone through a number of different belief systems. I don't mean uh, being an adherent, but just studying them and seeing, you know, while everybody has reasons against everybody else, you know, you're not me and you're wrong because everybody does that. But how many religions actually produce evidence? But now when it comes to the topic of doubt, I used to think from my own background that uh, doubts were solved chiefly by evidence. And I had to change most of my views. And I changed most of my views from interviewing doubters. They came to me, and I was teaching college, and uh, students started coming to me and saying, I'm going through that right now, or I have this issue, or can you help me with this? And I learned very quickly that you could have all the evidences in the world, and their turmoil continues. So I developed um, a a, a hypothesis that says that probably, uh, we actually, I actually worked with a clinical psychologist and we tested this, but uh, maybe only 15% of doubters are convinced, affected, assuaged by evidence. And most doubters questions come from for emotional reasons um you know i used to be a christian and my pastor had an affair and it really burned me or 
uh, I got some friends who are Christians and they're jerks or, um, you, you know, just periphery things or, you know, I suffer from anxiety or I suffer some, from depression and I often wonder if any religion is true. Can you help me? So I started addressing more emotional type situations and that seemed to be what most people were asking about. But you didn't know that till you got into it. And so it's been a long trek. I've had something like, um, I used to keep track of everybody I talked to, but as nearly as I can recall, I've had about 700 conversations, emails, everything, phone calls with uh, doubters. And sometimes they're very sincere. They're often very sincere. People don't call me unless they're sincere. They don't just call me and say, I want to scream at you. Um, they call me and say, can you help me through this? I'm really struggling. So that's that's kind of my background and how I changed some of my views. And and I find that the largest majority of doubt, whether believing or unbelieving doubt, is emotional. And we need more than just evidence to uh, get people over tough spots in their life. I, I guess that's a brief summary. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And before I just before I turn it over to you, David, to give your take. Um, uh, yeah, I just number one, I want to vouch for Gary. I mean, he he puts his money where his mouth is. He he really cares. Uh, him above everyone else. He's been with me through my doubts from the very beginning for for years now. Um, you know, trying to answer all my doubts and and answer them sincerely and letting me dictate, you know, what what's important to me and that sort of thing. So he, he really listens and tries to give uh, sound advice there. Um, now, one thing I did just want you to clarify, because you alluded to a difference between factual doubts and emotional doubts. Um, so you, you give three different types of doubts. Did you want to just sort of quickly define the differences between them? Yeah. Uh, what? Factual doubt. Now, now, Dale, interestingly enough, you and I talked for how long, Dale? Six years? Uh, it's going on about eight years now, I eight think. Eight years. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, I, would, I would characterize your questions as, large, as almost totally being factual. Mm -hmm. And especially to talk for eight years and answer questions and have them mostly all be factual. I, I could tell you that's, that's quite rare, um, but it happens. I would say that the hallmark of a factual doubter is help me with this, help me with that. Hey, Michael Conis, you know, a former guest of yours on this program, uh, Mike told me to go ahead and use his name and tell the story anytime I wanted to. But when I first met with Mike, and started talking to Mike. I mean, we're talking, boy, I have to think about it, 20 years ago. Um, Mike's doubts were factual. And I'll always remember him sticking his head in my office and asking me this one question. And I answered it maybe in five, six, seven minutes. And he said, all right, hey, that's cool. All right, thanks for your help. See you later. And he never brought that question up again. Now, to me, that's kind of a hallmark of a factual doubter. Someone listens and there's a, if there's an answer, now if there's not an answer, they're free to go on and be more skeptical and come back with rejoinders. But if there's an answer, they're, they're satisfied and they go on to the next question. But an emotional doubter, they can hear the exact same presentation. And especially if it's a guy, fellows in particular, men, um, they think they're factual doubters. And let's say they come, they contact me and they say, can we talk about the resurrection? I say, sure. So we talk about the resurrection and when we're done with two or three hours, I don't mean in one sitting, but if we have several epi episodes and, and we're done, mm -hmm. they might say to me, wow, this is really exciting. I'm kind of feeling on top of cloud nine, just that there might be some kind of answers. And I said, well, I'll say to them, well, look, let me make a prediction. If you're at the 100% mark today, uh, my guess is you're going to be 80 tomorrow, and in half a week, you're going to be 60, and next week, you're going to be calling me again, going, I've got the same questions, because in those cases, that's, that's a hallmark of the emotional doubter, and the emotional doubter, uh, here's some signs. Number one, the doubt hurts, oftentimes, depends on how long they're into it, uh, maybe years. I was. It was years for me. And emotional doubt can hurt. Um, 
another one is you can eliminate the best evidences in town with a very well-placed what if. What if you're wrong? Uh, what if this happened? And you say, well, yeah, but here's four reasons that's not what's going down. And the response is, but, but let's just say what if. And, and I try to point out, if you're going to base yourself on what ifs, you're going you're gonna to have issues here. And, and that's why your assurance today goes down. And by next week, it's, it's zero again. Uh, so emotional doubters hurt. They ask what if questions. And they say facts diff, uh, uh, matter to them. But even when they tell you their question has been answered, they call back later and they say, I'm still hurting. So that's emotional. The third one, Dale, that I didn't mention, you're right. I talk about three. The third one is volitional. And volitional doubt, what I call volitional, I've called that in a, in a couple of books. Um, the hallmark of volitional doubt would be a, an emotional doubter, maybe started as factual doubt, kind of morphs to emotional doubt because their uh, needs weren't met. They, they don't feel different. Yeah, thanks for your answers, but I don't feel different. And it morphs to emotional. And emotional, that's almost like a sore that kind of festers. I know that's an ugly word, but um, emotional doubt that, that festers for a long time often becomes volitional. And volitional, the, the kind of the worst case scenario, would be this guy's your, your best friend. He's your hunting partner, fishing. Uh, you spend a lot of time together. And the guy just doesn't care anymore about any religious question whatsoever. And you say, hey, what's with you? We haven't talked about this for a long time. Well, I don't, I don't care anymore. Why not? Well, I had questions and they weren't answered. And I went to my pastor. Not only did he not answer me, he had an affair. And then my best friend, uh, he scratched me out of his life because I wasn't religious enough for him. And I'm just bitter. And I don't think there's any reasons. And you go, well, do you think Christianity is true? You go, well, yeah, I think it's true. It just doesn't matter. So I don't care. It's just not my cup of tea. It's like, uh, you know, my old football team that I don't care if they lose every game in the season. It's just not my interest anymore. So that's a volitional one. Somebody who kind of loses interest and isn't answering the asking the same questions they were asking before. So that's a quick rundown. But by far, I'd say maybe 70% of all doubters, and I'd say probably more like 90% of everybody who contacts me, of these hundreds and hundreds of contacts, I just got one this morning, mm -hmm. um, a new one, and of these of these questions, they're almost always emotional. I guess you could say maybe the ones that are most motivated to call or email are the ones for whom it dominates their life. And they can't figure it out up or down. And the strange thing is this concerns unbelievers as well as believers. Perfect. All right. So, so yeah, uh, David, I think I'll turn it over to you because you have your own story of, of your doubts in your journey. And I think you also have three categories uh, of how you define doubt. So I, I'd be interesting to hear you lay that out and, and see how Gary, what Gary makes of that in relation to his uh, notion of doubt. So before I get into my story, Gary, if you don't mind me asking a couple of follow-up questions from, sure. from your story, sure. um, you're, the category of emotional doubt, I've heard you talk about this uh, in the past, uh, on Unbelievable, in fact, uh, May 5th, 2017, um, a friend of mine is going to join me uh, in another podcast that we do called Still Unbelievable, where we uh, go back and talk about some of the episodes of Unbelievable. So that's actually the subject of our next one. So I'm glad you mentioned the emotional doubt. One of the things that came up in my mind when I heard you say it was, it, is emotional only a, a factor for doubt? Uh, is that to somehow contrast it from um, a, a more cerebral type of doubt, a reasonable or rational doubt, and couldn't, couldn't one also talk about emotional belief? Um, so I, I was hoping that you could give us some more color on that. And the fact that you mentioned that uh, there was a study that showed that most doubt was emotional doubt, I wonder if you could tell us more about the study. Yes. Uh, on your first question, I think anything can be emotional. So 
so yes, I mean, I don't have, when someone contacts me, and again, I said it happened this morning. In fact, I've had about three or four of these contacts in the last week, believe it or not. And most of the time, I don't know the person. Um, one that contacted me uh, last night was a quote-unquote veteran doubter and a very serious one. The one that contacted me this morning is a new one who heard me lecture. So they come in from all over the place, and I don't have, the more you hear it, you I don't have a prescribed number of hoops that they must jump through to be a this or that or this or that. When I said, uh, uh, when I talked about testing, uh, a clinical psychologist, PhD clinical psychologist, is not only a professor in a PhD clinical counseling program, but works in a hospital with psychiatrists and people who are, um, you know, sometimes seriously in need. Um, this person, many years ago, this has been going on for maybe 10 years, but this individual decided to test my hypothesis and, and, and he had to do the testing because I'm not trained clinically, of course. And he set out, he had a number of volunteers, uh, two or 300, as I recall, and they were given a battery of, of uh, I hate to say tests, but I think that's what they were. And they took these, these questionnaires and they were uh, sized up according to typical psychological areas, such as anger, depression, anxiety, and he, he was interested. I hope I'm explaining this the right way, because if he were here, he could say, ah, let, 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 me, let me jump in here and tell you what really happened. You, you know, your explanation is um, not the, clinically the best, you know, because I kind of just let him do his own thing. But I had a few hundred uh, people that contacted me that by that point, and he was trying to find out with volunteers how, not, not people who called me, by the way, but just volunteers who agreed to be tested. A uh, number of them were college students, and a number of them were in the general population. And he wanted to see if my thesis was true regarding factual and emotional and volitional. He developed a questionnaire that counselors could actually use in a counseling situation and tried to find out what psychological states were most comparable to what I called factual or philosophical doubt, emotional doubt, evolutional doubt. And he found out that there were actually some psychological markers that loaded pretty closely and the emotional, what I considered the emotional doubter, and I said they would act like they were, you know, it was painful Interestingly enough, it often loaded with a type of anxiety, what, you know, anxiety can be very painful. And the, the um, volitional doubt often loaded with anger or depression. I thought, well, bingo, that's, that's just really interesting. Now, I got to warn you guys, I, I'm a lay person when it comes to psychological matters. I'm not a psychiatrist, psychologist. I'm not even a counselor. Um, as Dale can tell you, I I talk to people who have doubts because I went through it for 15 years and I'm just a fellow traveler. I'm not a professor in any way. And I, I mean, a, a, a specialist in this area. Mm -hmm. But uh, his, the results, some of the results he got were really interesting. And, I, and I'm sure if somebody's listening and they are trained in these things psychologically, they could say, well, you're not really saying that the right way. I think you mean this, but this. I, I'm given a very lay person's definition of this testing that my my uh, colleague did to see how these things loaded psychologically. So I'm just doing my best way to, to kind of characterize. But I can also tell you very unscientifically that of all the people who contact me, and maybe to contact you presupposes a certain piece, species of doubt, but the ones who talk to me, they'll write, and especially the men will try to sound real rational, and they'll say, 
hey, I need some evidence. And I and not like Dale. I mean, I got to say that Dale would stay on task and would want the evidence and always want evidence and never morph to this other view. But far more common is the, can we start talking about facts? And then how come I'm anxious? How come I'm on depression medicine? How come I'm doing this? How come I'm doing that? And so you knew right away that certain things were going on in their lives. And this was a ramification of other things they were going through under a doctor's care, which of course, uh, was it, was not me? I don't, I don't do that kind of thing. So, so, so anyway, can I, can, can I just ask one more follow up, which is, uh, in terms of, since you deal with so many people with so much doubt, yeah. what, it, what area stands out as the area that people doubt the most? I mean, or do they or is it doubt that there's a God? Is it doubt that oh well, there's a god but this religion thing i've got wrong uh you know i don't know that i've got that right or wrong what are what are people doubting i get very few people who ask me to prove god's existence but i get a lot of people ask me about is there meaning in life how do we know that when we die and the leaves blow over our grave that we're no more and we have no memory and and uh, we're just dead. Uh, is there any life after death? That's a common question. Is there any kind of life after death? Is there meaning, uh, morality? Is there any reason to live a certain way? But since I do so much on the resurrection, by far the kind of question I get the most is how would we know if the resurrection occurred? And like I said, um, Christians can be Christians can be worse doubters and ask better questions than some of the skeptics I get. I get. But having said that, um, skeptics call me who are not Christians by their own uh, description of themselves, and they also will ask the same thing. A, a Christian who is doubting the truth of Christianity and a non-Christian who wonders if Christianity is true, when they address the resurrection— if you didn't previously know who they are, you know, this guy's name is Bob. Uh, this gal's name is Karen. Um, if all you knew was a name and you heard their questions, you frequently can not tell the difference uh, between whether they were a Christian or non-Christian. When it comes to the resurrection, they're asking the same, couldn't this happen? Couldn't that have happened? Why should I believe what you're saying if I, unless I assume inspiration, which I don't require anybody to assume, but... Um, they'll talk the same way and ask the same questions. I think that's very interesting. So yeah. in, in my own personal story, I've got to tell you, when I, when I faced doubt, the doubt itself was a reason for more doubt for me. So just to give you uh, and the audience a little bit of background on, on who I am, I was practically born in the church. My father was a preacher. I was baptized at age seven. Uh, and there's there's a story there, uh, but where I come from in the in the deep American South, being baptized young is fairly common. Not quite so common that I started preaching at age 12. Um, I started teaching classes and had a very small youth ministry by 15, uh, assistant minister by age 21, uh, and very much following. Um, a path in in the ministry. This was a, a, a path that was, one might say, was laid out uh, for me from the from the very beginning. Uh, I was fairly intelligent. I had a pretty good deal of talent uh, by way of communicating. Uh, I knew the Bible very well. I knew my denomination's version of religion uh, extremely well, and so I uh, one one might say that I was gifted in the cause. Uh, Doubts, though, happened for me, I wouldn't say, well, fairly early in that it, all, all of this happened to me early uh, because I was, I was so young. But I would say somewhere in my teens, I started having uh, doubts about my denomination's distinctives. That was probably the first area of serious doubt. And I started coming to conclusions that um, my denomination's distinctives were actually wrong. And that was a major problem for me because we were the kind of people that taught, you know, if 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 we're wrong about you know these things, there is no right. You know, this is the only 
view for it. And once I came to the conclusion that, no, we, we actually are wrong about this, that, that was difficult for me. It wasn't easy to just slot into some other denomination or mindset. Uh, but then I began uh, having doubts about the accuracy and authority of Scripture. And as um, you, you may not agree bec uh, because of your particular speciality, I would, I would argue that outside of the Bible, there's no Christianity, there's no God, there's no Christian story that, that can stand up uh, sans Bible. And so once you lose the Bible, you lose almost everything. And what you have left is God and an attempt to rebuild some kind of foundation on how you relate to this God outside of your church and outside of the Bible, which is very difficult. And I eventually came to doubt the existence of God as well. And so by the time I was around 40, uh, I was out the door, very nearly out the door uh, by 40 at, at any rate. Uh, and so that's, that's just a little bit of my journey. But the fact that I had doubts in the first place, uh, that I could doubt a relationship with God that once I thought uh, was, a, was a certain thing, was itself a matter of question for me. And I, and I want to throw it to you. Does it not seem like a problem that a person who has been in relationship with God can come to doubt God? For instance, I cannot come to doubt you, Gary. And I cannot come to doubt you, Dale. Uh, I cannot come to doubt my wife. Now, I can come to dislike you. I, I don't think that that will happen, but I can't come to doubt your existence. It's simply not possible uh, in a stable mind. And so I, I wonder how it is even possible to doubt God if he is real, if you have, in fact, had a relationship with him. I, David, I, I, that last sentence, uh, say it again, you have no reason to doubt somebody you believe in and what did you say about having a stable mind right so if if you're if you're a person with a you know a stable mind uh, things happen to the mind but i i there are some things that you cannot disbelieve uh i cannot for instance disbelieve in gravity no matter how hard you tell me that it's not true i cannot disbelieve that you are a real person i believe you're a real person there's nothing that anyone can tell me uh that would convince me that you're not uh, I believe that Dale is a real person. In fact, I consider him a friend. Um, you know, our friendship can fade over the years, but I can never disbelieve in him. And so what I'm suggesting is that there are some things that a stable individual cannot disbelieve. And yet people start disbelieving in God after having believed in him and after having had relationship with him. And that seems to be a very unique and hard to explain thing. I'm I'm just sitting here almost shrugging my shoulders because the way I would look at that, if you came up to me after a lecture or if you were one of my PhD students, that, that's all I teach right now, but if you came up to me and said that to me, it would be a non-starter for me. It would be a, new, a moot point. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. I would say, David, you're, you're welcome to your own worldview and you're welcome to have your own thoughts, but... Shoot, I I don't have a problem at all with what you're doing, and I don't see why you should have a problem doubting. Um, and, and people often say to me, "Why do we doubt?" And I'll say, "Well, well, first of all, it's not dependent on whether you're a, are a Christian, another religion, no religion, a naturalist. We all doubt for the same reasons." And you go, "Well, wow, that's a crazy kind of comment because we're all different." So. So then why do we doubt? Well, I tell people, number one, we're doubters because we're finite. And when someone says, well, what's finite mean? I could be funny. The, the more I, the more I, the better I know them, the more I would say, well, are you God? No, I don't even believe in God. Or no, um, definitely I'm not God. Well, then you're finite. That's the definition of finite. And because we are persons who are, are not all-knowing and not all-anything, whether you believe anybody is all-knowing, um, because we're incomplete persons and we born, we're born and we live and we grow and we accumulate knowledge and we move on, our interests change, our friends change, uh, because we're in that state of flux and we're people, 
Of course we're going to ask questions. And there are que- there are people who question, you said gravity, okay, I won't talk about gravity, but there are people who doubt the most basic things in life, and they're, they're entitled to their own questions. And I don't think, as I kind of hinted at earlier, I don't think there's any issue between a Christian having these qu- questions and a non-Christian having these questions. We're all entitled to questions. So... But don't you see that the difference is that the Christian has already had a quote-unquote relationship? They've had the Spirit of God indwelling within them. Uh, they, greater they, is he within they, you that is within the world. That, that seems they, they to be a difference. That. Well, they claim they've had the Holy Spirit, and they claim that they have a relationship with God, and so do people in other religions. But if you claim, all right, you said, you said early in life you were a young Christian and you did some work with youth and you preached and it came very natural to you. Um, that's the state in which you believed yourself to be. And I would honor that. If you were talking to me, I'd say, okay, so you believed X, yes. And then later I came to believe Y. Okay, yep, I'm listening. You go, why should I be able to leave that belief? And I'd say, what belief? You left what belief? You you didn't leave a, you didn't leave a, yes, you left a belief, but you left, left what you believed to be true. We haven't established, we don't know if it's true, false, or in between. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you can say, before you're married, you dated this, this person, and you dated that person, and this guy was your best friend, but he's no longer your best friend, you've moved on, you used to have a job, now you have a different job. We, we change, and, and, it just doesn't phase me in the least that you would. Now that if it phases you, that's that's you know you're you're cross the bear so to speak. But it doesn't it doesn't even hit me as being odd that you would have questions because if you're right, and I don't know what you call yourself, a, atheist, agnostic, non-Christian, just general something, Buddhist, whatever you call atheist yourself. Atheist fine, unbeliever's probably better. Uh, atheist is fine. Yeah. Okay, so you're a naturalist of some stripe, right? Uh, I happen to be a naturalist, but uh, okay. that it w- it would be a mistake to conflate atheism and naturalism. There, well, there's sure. plenty of plenty of atheists who are not materialists. Well, sure, I mean, materialism is only the most common form of naturalism, but it's not the only form of naturalism. And 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 so wherever you put yourself on that spectrum. I would just take you at, at your starting point. If we just met and we're sitting down and talking, I'd say, no, you used to consider yourself a Christian, and now you don't consider yourself a Christian. I I just don't feel that. I just don't think that's in the slightest bit strange, any more so than if you said to me next week, uh, hey, change my view. I'm not a naturalist anymore. I'm a pantheist. Okay, fine. Fine. So where are you right now? Well, I'm here, and this is what I'm reading. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I, I just don't find these changes. It's typical of a finite being that doesn't know everything there is in the universe. Now, we may be talking about whether there is such a being somewhere in the universe, but the fact that you yourself would change views, and you said, well, how can a Christian who had a relationship with the Holy Spirit change? I would say, <laughs> here's where I would flip back to my skepticism and I would say well David you're you're a skeptic so you know what I'm going to say but how do you know that guy had a relationship with the Holy Spirit in the first place I mean he says he did but and didn't secondly even if the person did have a relationship with the Holy Spirit we all know that there's a a, a large theological group of Christians called Arminians and there are others who believe you can believe that and quote unquote lose it or shorthand would be you used to believe it you don't believe it now i just either from what well, guess what i'm saying is from me the christian viewpoint or from a philosophical viewpoint it's irrelevant to me i i would just take you at your word and i'd say okay that's where you are right now let's move on but i don't find that as i don't find anything you're saying is strange no, no. One thing, um, just to just to uh, sort of butt in here, um, before we move on, transition to the real seeker or honest seeker section, uh, David. You, I know you've uh, given three steps or stages of doubt, uh, just like Gary has his three types of doubt. Uh, maybe you could just sort of briefly define 
how you categorize doubt and and then we'll have Gary just give a quick uh come back on what he thinks about that and then we can move on to the real secret yeah that, that that's a good point Dale I'd like to hear David do that too uh I'd like to know why he thinks on the same question why he thinks is odd that somebody might change views okay uh, let me let me tackle that one first um I, I don't think it's odd that people would change views depending on the thing they're changing views about. There are plenty of things that, you know, we hold loosely enough that we don't know for sure. And, you know, we'll, we'll believe it for a little bit and get a little bit more information and stop believing the next. It, that's not odd. But I think that there are some things that it is uh, would be odd to change views on. Uh, in fact, almost impossible, as I mentioned. So once again, it's not it's not odd if I were to decide one day that I no longer want to be friends with Dale. That that would not be odd. I don't think that it's going to happen, but that's ex that's explainable. Um, um, but it would be highly unusual if I were to wake up one morning and say, you know, I don't think that Dale exists. Th that would be almost, in fact, I would say that for me, that would be impossible. I would have to suffer some type of brain damage to wake up one morning and say, yeah, Dale, I, I see these emails from him. I see that I uh, listen to these podcasts I did with him. I don't think he's a real person. I don't think he exists. That is not a, th a category of thing that you could doubt. And so if a person doubted something like that, I, I would find that strange. And I'm, I am, I'm, I'm surprised that you wouldn't find that strange. I, I don't even in the slightest. In fact, but let me ask you, David, you, you're, you're friends with David. If you guys live next door to each other, or you grew up together, or whatever, um, you would not da doubt Dale's existence because you guys have gone to ball games together. You've watched, uh, you know, football on TV together. You've you you have all, you've gone out to dinner. You've been with him physically, but for the person who said, "I used to believe in God. I had a relationship with the Holy Spirit." You go, oh, well, did you have dinner with him? No. Watch a football game? No. But I believe he's the God of the universe. Okay. But that's not the same as going out to dinner with Dale. Um, to me, it's simply a matter of you used to be convinced God exists, and now you're not. Um, all right. Let's move on. Okay. It's just, well, just I, not strange one little bit to me. I, I, then what you're saying is that the type of relationship one has with God is uh, substantially different than the type of relationship that we have with an individual. And while I can understand that physically, when, when I was in church, I, wouldn't, I would have said that your, your knowledge and certainty of your relationship with God for a number of factors, including the indwelling of the Holy Spirit— should be as certain as your relationship with your wife. And that's in fact, correct. it should that, not only be as view. certain, it should be stronger. You, that's your view. Maybe but, but, I yeah. a Christian and don't have that same view mm -hmm. or, or have a different slant on it. I, I just think maybe that has something more to do with the your dad and his being your early mentor in life and what you did in the church and what you believed about the Holy Spirit. And you're... You're, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> so, you're free to have all those beliefs. I don't okay. have a problem with any of them. Sure. Okay. Well, I um, that that's fine. We we clearly have would have had different perspectives on that. I mean, putting putting on my Christian hat, I I yeah. think that you and I come from different perspectives. I think that Dale is uh, trying sure. to cut in. You asked what? me two questions, though. Oh, yeah. The the um, my levels of of doubt. Uh, so there's nothing academic. It's just a, uh, a simple way of talking about doubt for me. So uh, level one doubt for me is just a basic uh, type of doubt that everyone has. It's it's something that you may not have a great deal of knowledge about. Maybe you hold that information loosely. You hear some information that makes you think, oh well, I could be wrong about that. It's it's a it's a very common type of doubt that does not change or affect your your outlook on life or what you're doing. Uh, a level two doubt uh, for me would be the kind of doubt that makes you have to seek answers because it's it's important. If wrong about this thing, it does affect your life. It does have a, a significant change. 
Uh, and you might accept answers that are somewhat superficial because it makes you feel good to have those answers, but you, you at least care enough about it to start seeking answers because the outcome makes a difference. Uh, and what I call a level three doubt is um, probably the type of doubt that you call the volitional doubt. Uh, I, th I think that we would probably track uh, very well there. It's the, it's the place where you come to where you have looked uh, for the answers. You know the situation is important, but you cannot find answers or any comfort or satisfaction that alleviates that doubt. Uh, and so you, you have to, you have to either live with that doubt or stop categorizing it as doubt altogether, uh, and say that, yes, you, you now have knowledge that you were wrong about a thing and, and this is now new knowledge, but it's, it's the type of doubt, uh, that you don't easily get up from. Now, now Gary, that's a, there's an interesting point here. Cause I know that you we're talking a lot about, uh, you know, uh, doubt versus certainty and that sort of thing. And I, I think there are degrees of certainty, obviously, and and my my degree uh, of knowledge that, that you exist um, may be less certain than the knowledge that I have that God exists. Whereas, so there's there's differences in that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of times, I find that skeptics uh, are sort of confused about the notion of faith in in relation to doubt um, and and that sort of thing. So. What do you think uh, David's got here? What What is the relationship between doubt and faith versus certainty and that sort of thing, in your opinion? Are you asking me, Dale? Uh, yeah, sorry, that was for you, Gary. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, uh, David, while I was listening to you, I wrote down your few key words on your three levels. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're very different than than my three. I would. I don't think so either. I think that, the, I think that we the share general, something there. The general doubt, the the opening the door and walking into a kind of thing, could be factual doubt, and it just starts with somebody who woke up one day and realized they wonder why there's pain and suffering in the world, or they heard somebody raise a doubt about the resurrection. They said, "Hey, what gives here?" And, and but. The next category, when you say makes you seek answers, depends on how they're seeking answers but and what they're asking. But emotional doubters are highly driven to find responses because of the exact way you said it. They realize that if they don't get doubts in these, if they don't get answers in these areas, something's going to change in their life. And, you know, if it's not true, I want to know it. But if it is true, I do want to know it and blah, blah, blah. It's uh, scary. It's, that's it, a place it's, of fear. Okay, now, now right away, see, using the word scary, which I, I said earlier that maybe the chief characteristic of emotional doubt is pain. And it hurts them to think through some of these things. The strange thing about it is, David, I, I talked to atheists regularly who have this same thinking. I got an email from a guy years ago and the first line, I've had a 20 year relationship slash discussion with him, talked on the phone uh, for hours and a lot of emails. And here's his first line of his first email. He said, I'm an atheist. Please help me. I don't want to go to hell. First line. Uh, here's another guy I'm dealing with this week. I've gotten five emails from him in the last week. He says, I'm definitely not a Christian. Uh, I've not been brought up that way. Member of another faith. Um, but my life is torn up right now when someone tells me you do these things. Uh, you talk about this. Can you talk to me? Because I'm in a lot of pain right now. But uh so, what is it to become a Christian? What am I talking about? What am I supposed to believe? What what's going on? And he and he's an unbeliever. So, I, I think a lot of this has to do with the nature of human beings, not the nature. That's why I said we were finite. Um, it has a lot to do with the nature of human beings and inquisitiveness, and especially for certain people, the reason it's painful is because they thought they had a mooring in their life. Maybe, David, it was your upbringing and what you believed, and you were secure with your dad and secure in your church and secure with the people you taught and preached to. And if someone rips that from you, 
you might be fine in two years, but for those two years, you're in arguably an emotional upheaval because you don't know if you can believe the things that you were always told you have to believe or things are going to be really rough and life won't, two, two plus two equal doesn't equal four anymore. Um, I mean, I think, I think we're discussing the same things from, you know, like a diamond. We're looking at them from different facets. Mm-hmm. But it, so far, what we said, I don't think it makes a lot of difference whether the person asking the questions is a Christian or a non-Christian. Their, their life is in a state of upheaval, and I just gave you two examples of, of uh, one guy called himself an atheist, and I don't know what the second guy called himself, but he says, I assuredly am not a Christian. And uh, not not a Christian who starts having questions. He was never a Christian. And they're both writing to me with the same kind of gusto, like, help me, help me. I'm a lot of pain. This hurts. And uh, so for them, they're, they're calling me because they want to know, is there any basis for what they believe or should they just give it up? And it often comes down to, is there an afterlife? Is there meaning in life? Um so I think we're discussing phenomena that are pretty similar, and maybe back to your case, David, it's perceived differently by persons, but in actuality, much of that, Christian or non-Christian, is our perception, not the way things really are. So let's okay. let's let's consider that. I want to. I I I'm I'm just looking at the clock uh, too, and I I uh, respect uh, Gary's time constraints. I want to I want to swap chairs with uh, Dale for a little bit, um, because Dale has a perspective on uh, the honest seeker, and I've I've got some questions that I want to fold into there. But I kind of want to hear you and ta- Dale talk about this a little bit because I've heard Dale's perspective and I think it's a little bit out there. It's a little bit challenging for me. I'm, I'm wondering um, what your perspective is. And uh, you know, this might be a flop. You guys might just have a lot of violent agreement, but I'm, um, I'm curious to see how this goes. So let me just, let me just ease into the question and ask both of you. Um, do you believe that uh, religious doubt, that doubting God, is the fault of the doubter. Um, and I, I would come at this from a Romans 1 perspective where Paul seems to say there's no, there's no excuse. Um, uh, you, you should believe, and if you don't believe, it, you know, you're just a sinner. Kind of, kind of an ad hominem attack against the doubter. So I, I just want to start there, first of all. Is, if a person has doubts about God or does not believe uh, or stops believing, is, is that somehow the fault of the doubter? Do you believe that we control our beliefs to the point that, you know, we, we can somehow decide um, what we believe and what we don't believe? So let me, let me start with uh, Gary and then move to Dale. Well, I, I could go back and forth on several little things you mentioned, but maybe I'm at, I hope I'm answering the, the same questions you're asking. Um, you're doing fine. Is, is doubt an issue? No. Are Christians free to doubt? Yes. Does the Bible say you can't doubt? Absolutely not. Um, are there doubters in the Bible? It, the Bible's loaded with doubt. In fact, um, j- just think briefly, um, and David, from your own background, if I said Job, what would you think? You think, oh, I don't know, man, a dude who was really hurting and asked God, is there any justice in the world? And he came to grips with his with his uh, doubt and his pain. Now, I said, do you know any others in that category? Well, not like Job, not that bad. All right, how about Abraham? Abraham is called, um, well, here we have a couple guys. Abraham, David is a man after God's own heart. Uh, Abraham is often characterized by his faith, and yet Abraham had a half dozen run-ins. We don't, we don't often read Genesis real carefully, but the description is that he had a, a number of times, twice he lied about his um, wife being his mother, mother, I'm sorry, sister, yeah. his wife being his, his uh, sister, because in one text it actually says he was fearful that if he didn't say she was a sister, he, they would have killed him. Well, okay, now the issue is God said to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. All right, right or wrong, if he really believed that, 
why is he afraid he's going to die? Because he's not the father of many nations yet. So Abraham went through a lot. Read the Psalms, and I'm telling you what, Psalm 44 accuses God of sleeping on the job, breaking his promises, and says Israel did nothing to de- to deserve this. And he never straightens it out. He never says, praise God, end the psalm. He just is torn up. John the Baptist is in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the Messiah, or should we look for somebody else? And, and I take that like, are you really the Messiah? Because there's this guy down the street, his name's Buddha, and I, I'm just wondering. So Thomas, I won't believe until I see him. The Bible is full of doubt, and I don't see condemnation for doubt in general. Um, right, but all, all of those, none of those categories that you, or people that you mentioned disbelieved in God. They all believed in God. They, they may have uh, doubted at some point whether some promise would come true, or maybe they forgot themselves and got angry and you know, disobeyed or so forth. That's a good but, point. But, but you got James, the brother of Jesus, who is a, an avowed unbeliever. You got Paul, who is an avowed unbeliever and who thinks he's doing God a favor by killing Christians or imprisoning Christians. And he thought he was doing God a favor. He, was an, he, he said later, I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That's, James is a family. They, they, believed in, they still believed in God, though. They just didn't believe that Jesus was a Messiah, but they weren't, well, yeah, they weren't atheists. Well, no, but you, you didn't frame the question like, all right, we're talking about atheists here. Can they all doubt? Is that okay? I was putting in the context of Romans 1 and other passages. Romans 1 is not just talking about Christians. You're right. It's talking about a variety of views. But if a person came to me and said, well, I'm not an atheist, but I don't think you Christians have any reason to believe what you believe, I would certainly call him a doubter, but he's not an atheist. Uh, I guess all I'm saying is I was going through Scripture passages just to show that in the Bible— there are um, unbelievers like the Pharisee Paul, then Saul of Tarsus, unbelievers like the brother James, who when Jesus comes to town in, in Mark chapter 3, the Greek the Greek word for James's attitude and his family's, it said, was that he thought Jesus was nuts. Yes, He actually thought Jesus was nuts. The Greek word is that Jesus had two minds, like a sane one and an insane one, and they tried to get him out of the public view so their family wouldn't take a criticism. I mean, this is pretty far wide of the mark that, yeah, they believed it was just a bad day. Um, you know, and both Paul and James become Christians because they thought they'd seen the risen Jesus. So uh, that's evidence. They're seeking evidence. I, I, David, w- whether I get verses for it or not, My own private view is doubt can be wrong, and a person can think they believe certain things and something else can be true, but I don't generally think that doubt is a sin, that Mm -hmm. doubt is evil, and people who ask questions are obviously going to hell because we shouldn't be doing that. I I just don't relate to those kind of views at all. Sure. Well, I I guess uh, I may have used the word doubt a little bit too loosely. So what I really should have asked was unbeliever, a a person who has, you know, heard heard the message, what what have you. They've they've seen the word, they've they've read the Bible, they've listened to sermons, they've, they've done... Sure. They've been exposed to it. Maybe they've even been a part of a church for a while, and they simply decide that they do not believe. They come to the knowledge, uh, because it's not really a decision, that they don't believe. And I'm, what I'm asking is that a person who ends up in that unbeliever camp, however they end up there, are you? would you say that that is their fault that they are there, or is that just the nature of things that we can't control what we do and don't believe? Okay, I don't want to get... I don't want to get too philosophical, too deep here, but I don't believe that things happen to us because we are predestined somehow to be a loser. However you define loser, I, I don't think we're, we're predestined to uh, believe a certain way and we can't believe otherwise. I would take a position known as libertarian. I take liber- uh, the libertarian, which had nothing to do with politics. But it's a libertarian view of free will, and the hallmark of libertarian thought is it could have been otherwise. I just like I could order chicken tonight at the restaurant instead of a steak. 
I can believe different things in my religious uh, views. So, no, I don't think we're predestined or have to do it or something like that. Um, and I think we're, uh, we can believe and follow up what we want to, and Christians and non-Christians, maybe some more than others, but it's probably more of a personal thing, can have doubts, and God knows that. And there's so many dozens of doubting passages in the Bible, it's hard for me to think that God just rules that stuff out and all these people are losers. I just think people go through things. It's my earlier idea that we're finite, and from a biblical viewpoint, we're sinners. So we're incomplete people, and we shouldn't be surprised that we, we're not God. Okay. This, yeah, this and, and they all, just to, yeah, and, and just to give my, my sort of take, because I know um, this is something uh, I've, with a lot of skeptics and with David, we've been sort of going back and forth on that. And, um, basically, what, what David's trying to do, it's, it's, I think it's either all, it's either someone not, either someone doubting to the point where they don't believe is either all God's fault or it's all the person's fault. Um, I sort of take, with my idea of what, what's it called to be a real seeker, I think there's a mutual responsibility. Without God, no one can come to faith, that the Holy Spirit is needed and necessary to open our eyes to the truth and that sort of thing. But going with what Gary's saying, to back him up, I'm a firm believer in libertarian free will as well. So I think the person has a responsibility to be a real seeker. So the way I, I define that is, is number one, uh, you have to be genuinely open to, to the truth. You, you have to be genuinely open to whatever truth uh, is revealed to you. Uh, the second is you should be an active seeker. Um, you know, don't just be intellectually lazy, just sit on, you know, sit on your rumps and wait, you know, expect God, you reveal the truth to me kind of thing. No, you, you got to get out there and, and do your best, the best of your ability to try and wrestle with these and, and that sort of thing. I think, you know, this is good for us to develop certain heaven fit skills and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the third qualification is once you discover that truth, you should be willing to obey uh, or follow that truth to achieve your ultimate purpose. Now, if you meet those three criteria, then you're a real seeker. Uh, and it's then upon God uh, to reveal the truth to you through the Holy Spirit, uh, through the witness of the Holy Spirit and that sort of thing uh, before you reach the point of no return. Um, because that that's ultimately you know, our ultimate purpose is, is for salvation. So there was a time when I would say I was a real seeker, but I, I hadn't come to the knowledge of Christianity. Um, God and his foreknowledge knew it was best to reveal it to me uh, back in May of, of this year, as opposed to two years prior and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, just sort of wondering what, what you make of Gary. Does that, does that make sense to you? Do, you? do you understand what I'm saying, where it's sort of a mutual responsibility and both parties are needed to go Gary? Yeah, yes, I, I, I'm tracking with you, Dale. I mean, we've had hours and hours and hours of conversations, so uh, yeah. that doesn't mean, just because we've had hours of conversation doesn't mean you and I agree, but I, on any topic, I mean, we're, you know, we're free people, but I, I do resonate with what you're saying, and I would even say a Christian could be a seeker. Um, yeah. See, I don't, I don't, I don't have these airtight categories where somebody's this or that, or that God expects you to do this or that, or God's very upset with you, Dale, because you were asking questions. And, and like David, you were raised in a Christian home, and but you, re, you know, I, I don't say rebelled, you know, like the way some, some, you know, kid does, but I mean, you questioned your beliefs and, and I just, I've talked to so many people, I just don't find any of that be, to be strange. And don't forget, the people who, con they contact me. I don't seek them out. So what I mean by that is, they come to me with an agenda. So they want to say, all right, you're the resurrection guy. Is there a basis for this or not? Okay, let's talk. Um, I'm being chewed up because I used to think there was a foundation for what I believe. Now I don't think there's any. Talk to me. Um, so they put something out on the table, and sometimes, David, it just starts as a discussion between friends, and, and I might 
Dale and I are a good example. Dale went way beyond the the, the normal uh, stretch. But I've had conversations with people. Mike Lacona, when Mike was going through his doubts, I knew him in those days, and he he almost walked away from Christianity. I remember the time he called me and said, I think I might be walking away. And there was another time in his life. He went through that twice. And and I just, I don't sit there and preach to him and tell him he's a loser. I, or Dale. Um, and Dale and Mike were very different because Mike was on the Christian side wondering if it was true. Dale was on the other side wondering if there was any reason to believe. Um I just take them right where they are, and they come to me and they go, hey, I'm all churned up. Can you help me with this? I might say, yeah, guys, that's not really my area. But I might say, well, hey, I've done a lot of research on near-death experiences or the subject of doubt or the resurrection of Jesus or things like that or what you have to do to be a Christian. See, that's another thing, David. I think people get hung up on super, super periphery things like well, if I don't get the answer to whether the believer is eternally secure, I'm just going to be a basket case. Um, and I'll say, hey, well, why don't you answer a different question? Because how you answer that question just isn't going to stop your doubts. And I thought that's what we were working on. So um, people think they're, they make they take certain dead ends, I think, and try to make them into key issues. And I think, I tell my students all the time, I think if we are sure that Jesus is the Son of God, died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead, that's the core of Christianity. And if that's true, Christianity follows. But two things, uh, InterVarsity and, and uh, uh, Zondervan, two very well-known Christian publishers, they have something like 50-something, three, four, and five used books. What that tells me is, Christians believe a wide number of things on most issues. And we don't condemn people for holding three views on sovereignty, free will. We just go, oh, yeah, you're a member of this church. And we might even tease with them. Yeah, I don't get along with Calvinists. And we all chuckle. Um, it's a teasing thing. But if we're sure about the center, the deity, death, resurrection, Christianity follows you don't have to worry. You don't have to work out 50 different questions. Just be sure about the center, and Christianity can be uh, true. And what's amazing about that is, and I'll stop with this, but those three, is Jesus the Son of God, did he really die by crucifixion? Was he raised from the dead? Is that the, planet, is that the God side of the gospel? And we're asked, do we want to believe in that sort of Jesus? And believe means to walk in his sandal, so to speak. It means to walk with him. Like when we say I do to a spouse, um, I do means a lifetime, and we joke about how much is involved in saying I do. Well, there's a lot involved in saying I do to Jesus, too. So if those three things are true, I can have questions at a bunch of different points. And how you and your wife wash the dishes, where you go on vacation, what you think about political parties— you know, marriages can survive, whatever the different views on those are, but you better get the center right. And if you're going to be married, you better have said I do. So I, that's kind of the way I look at it. And sure. So I, I hear I hear that you've got a, a, a call there in the background. So let, uh, look, in in respect of your time, we've got a we've got a page of uh, notes in a couple of categories that we haven't touched. I'm, I'm just going to ask if you've got time to take one more question and maybe, um, if you have enjoyed your time, we can, we can come back and touch some of these other, uh, categories such as evidences, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah, because I thought, I, I think it would be fine. If you've got one more question, that's fine. Yeah. But as far as, as far as stopping here, I think that's fine too, because you announced at the beginning, and Dale even told me ahead of time. But you announced at the beginning that we're mostly discussing the nature of doubt today. So, yes, you know, we weren't supposed to solve what Jesus raised from the dead is a Bible word of God, uh, is is uh, Christianity the one true religion? We haven't we we didn't set out to do any of that. We no. just discussed the nature of doubt, and I think we did a very good job doing some of the parameters here. I I think so too. Um, and uh, in, in fact, we've got we've got a lot of uh, things in the area of doubt that I'd like to come back on some other time. But for for now, I, I would like you. to I would like to just get your 
uh, thought. And Dale, uh, feel free to have some thought here too, because my thoughts on this don't matter much. But I think the question is important. Uh, so we've talked about doubts, but what we what I've tried to steer us toward a little bit, and we haven't really gotten to, is the the place where doubts move to that level, th- what I call the level three and what you call a volitional doubt of, right. look, I've done the study, I've done the research, I don't believe it. I'm not a doubter anymore. I'm, a, I'm, I'm what you would call an unbeliever. Right. I just don't believe. And, and it's not that I am um, being reactionary or, or rebellious. I have done as much head work and heart work uh, and research as I can and try as I might, whether I want to believe it or not, I don't believe it. And that person then dies. Uh, and has to face the judgment. What happens to that person? Well, of course, uh, David, I'm not laying anything on you, but of course you don't believe in a judgment. So uh, nothing from your viewpoint. Well, but, l- let's say the person's wrong. Let's say I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, right. like, that guy t- like that guy I told you about whose first email was, I'm an atheist, I don't want to go to hell, help me. Um, that's a little inc- inc- incongruous. And their beliefs don't go together. It might imply that in the back of his mind, he's got some contradictory beliefs, but he fears judgment. Um, I think we do need to get back to the evidential question. And David, per- personally, I mean, if the way Dale and I started was Dale, uh, like yourself, Dale was very friendly. He was never pejorative. We never had a crossword in eight years. Most probably our ever t- our. Talks averaged what, Dale? At least an hour and a half average? I would say to you, two hours, actually. Two hours? Yeah, okay. I know you always say uh, one hour max, but it, yeah, usually. I know, Dale, yeah. I said that, and then we didn't do it, and we both enjoyed it. And yeah. and I think that that kind of relationship is fantastic. I don't like talking to guys who all they want to do is call and tell me I'm a loser. Well, first of all, people don't call, and if, if they thought that, they wouldn't call me, because that's not what they call me for. Um, but if a guy wanted to talk to me about evidence, David, I would say, let's go for it. But let's not ask the question, according to what I just said, let's not ask the question about whether God created the world and if he did in six days or in 13.75 billion years, um, or what part of evolution could God have used the process of evolution. These are all interesting issues. Or the one we talked about earlier, is free will libertarian or is free will prescribed? Um, we could do those things, but I don't think we're going to get to the center. So if a person, Dale and I agreed very early on, every once in a while we took a little hiatus, but in eight years, yeah. But uh, our discussions were almost totally on the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus, because Dale acknowledged, and if these things are true, it makes a real difference in life. And if not, that makes a real difference in life. So we went right for the juggler, so to speak. And Dale would call up every time, and he would warn me ahead of time with an email, and he'd say, these are going to be my three major questions. We're going to, let, you know, let's go for it Tuesday night or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And we would talk. So that's about where I am. I, I think it's, I think the nature of doubt is very similar between Christians and non-Christians. Not their heart, necessarily, not where they're coming from, not their view. But what they're asking can be very similar. And it's a question of evidence. And if, David, if you said to me, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but if a person in your situation said to me, I've I've studied this all, let me just tell you, there's no God, no resurrection, no afterlife. I would just smile. I would just say, hmm, I really wonder if you've heard the evidence. I really do, because what's happened in these fields, it oftentimes takes a specialist to dig in, and even the average Christian in the pew um, hasn't heard this because their pastor doesn't study this because the pastor's too busy doing funerals and and um uh weddings and so on and he or she doesn't have time to study the question so i'm amused because i think well you know i hey, listen i told a friend of mine this guy if i told you you guys would know the name he's a very well-known ex-evangelical it's not bart ehrman but he's a very well-known ex-evangelical who is a thoroughgoing atheist. And he and I hit it off just incredibly. First time we met. 
and he's a big football fan. And I said to him, dude, I wish you lived next door to me and you could come over on Sunday afternoons or meet at your place and we could watch football together. And I, and I just teased him. I just met him. We've been talking for an hour straight. He's national. He's internationally known. He's written a number of books. And I said, and just to tease him, I said, at the end of one year, at the end of football season, we could hash this out over football. And at the end of the year, somebody is going to change their view, either you or me. And I just want to give you a hint. It's not going to be me. And he just roared. He thought that was hilarious. Not, not hilarious, like making fun of me. He just thought that was really cool. And ever since that time, we've been really good friends. And when he writes books, he says, yeah, well, Gary Habermas says, and then he goes, now, Gary's a really good guy and a really good friend, but we don't agree on this. And that's how I think relationships should be. Everybody I do this with, we're very cordial. Never, It never reverts to name-calling. We should take each other as human beings and take each other at face value. And David, that's probably one reason why um, I didn't react to some of your questions, because I would just, that, that seems to me I would be unfair to you to react that way, because I think it's more fair for me to just listen to what you're saying and take that as a starting point that that's where you're coming from. And we go from there on that. I don't sit here going, wow, what a sinner. Wow. What a loser. That, that's just not me. And, uh, and Dale can tell you that. So yeah. that's my perspective. Everything is evil, e equal. We're all on a equal playing field and we're part of the, like the, with the atheists and the football games, we're just sitting here doing life. And we're trying to figure out who's right and wrong because we know that maybe everything in the universe depends on where we come down for ourselves and our families. Those are big questions. Yeah. So I, I hope that uh, we can get you back and talk about some of those evidences. I want to give you a chance to uh, talk about uh, those evidences, maybe uh, some of the ones that uh, you don't get to talk about on podcasts a lot. And also, sure. I would like to rejoin... Um, that in that conversation with some of the reasons why someone like me might not find those evidences convincing. And Absolutely. It, I, I think that would be a great conversation. So if that's something I, that you're you, interested in, sure. You know, you, some, sometime in the spring or summer, we'd love to have you back. I mean, yeah, the, you get your day in court too. Uh, <laughs> you get to make your case and it's not all one sided. And David, you're not listening to me. You're really doing this wrong. What's wrong with you? What's your problem? Nothing like that. It's uh, where you're coming from. And you've got your story. And don't forget, I went through doubts myself for, for 10 years. Uh, Mike Lacona did. Uh, Dale just has just come out of a lengthy period of, and I can tell you, I don't know how long you guys have been friends, but Dale was a, a real seeker. Dale wasn't a call up and confess everything and say, I'm really a believer, but I just have questions about this and that. Dale had some really good questions and we had some really good conversations and that's fair because that's what human beings do they listen and they take both sides and they work through them so i think what you're saying is necessary yeah and i, I always remember uh, when i first came to you my initiating question I remember i was all i was very much in, in the sort of the thinking of some of our skeptic where it, I was, no, well, biblical inerrancy has to be true. Remember the Tyre prophecy? That oh, I do remember that, Dale, yes. <laughs> uh, that was a big deal for me, yeah, when I when I first came to Gary. And it was, yeah, through working with him, this is where I, I started. Gary got me to sort of see the light uh, about, well, maybe biblical inerrancy isn't an essential belief, right, that, of Christianity. Maybe, uh, how do you define the, the essential center of christianity the the essential doctrines and that sort of thing so um yeah me, me and gary have been been through the ropes on a lot of a lot of issues and that sort of thing it's it's fine to have doubts um but right. try to try to keep them in perspective that, that was uh, the advice that mike gave us as well you know try to try to keep these things in perspective don't okay this one little thing and the rest of it's garbage yeah try, try to Try to have a holistic perspective. Yeah, and, and Dale would once one thing so nobody gets the wrong idea. When you said Gary helped me see that scripture wasn't uh, central, that. what I meant was, yeah, what you think about scripture is central, but can you answer the questions Dale was asking without assuming at the start? I never said to Dale, mm -hmm. Dale, dude, un unless you believe the Bible's word of God, we can't talk. Well, yeah. no, I don't. That's why I'm calling. I have questions. Well, I guess we can't talk, Dale. Have a good day. Uh, it's not like that at all. 
I think the I think as as Dale started um, this this uh, uh, talk today. Uh, Dale said, Gary, Gary specializes on doing the resurrection without having to admit uh, Scripture. I think Scripture is very important, but you can get there without believing that the Bible is an errant word of God or something like that. In fact, how would an atheist even do that? If an atheist is going to come to you, they can't come to you and say, well, if you guys are right, maybe you're right. Okay, now for my questions. Well, he wouldn't be coming to you if he, if he had to agree with you to start. So well, this is, uh, we this is get the there. thing that we need to talk about the next time because that yeah. is an excellent question. How how do you come yeah. by that without the but, Bible? But but David, when I do resurrection, you not only I tell university audiences all the time, if the Bible's inspired, Jesus is raised from the dead. Good to go. If the Bible's not inspired, but it's a decent history book, good to go. Jesus is probably raised from the dead. But the Bible is not inspired and not reliable and not the word of God. Can we still get a resurrection? And I say unequivocally. And that surprises a lot of people, but you have to hear the data, and then you have to start formulating views to get around it. So, you know, that's that's what the evidence is all about. We'll Absolutely. do. Dale, take us out. Yeah, uh, yeah, so it's been a great, great time. Uh, I, I enjoyed the conversation, an honest, frank conversation between um, both my friends Gary Habermas and David Johnson here. Uh, hopefully the, the audience enjoyed this show on Doubt. Uh, I'll be putting a lot of, I, I organize a lot of sources uh, from Gary's website or various videos. Uh, he, he does have a lot to say about Doubt, uh, but other topics as well. So there's, there's a lot of resources that uh, we'll be providing in the sources. Yeah, please, please check them out. and. Uh, you know, seek seek God. He'll, you know, you'll find Him if, if you're a real seeker and you you really want the truth. Uh, just do your best, be as sincere as you can, and try to try your best to follow the truth. Uh, so, so yeah, thank you so much uh, again, Gary, for joining us today. Have a good time, guys. Thank you Thanks. so much, Gary. It's been great meeting you, and uh, we'll, we'll get back with you sometime. You get an email from uh, from the strange guy that you just met today. Next time you'll know him. And uh, you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I'll be glad to uh, come on the program. We'll, we'll contact you sometime in the spring. Thanks for talking, Pablo. It was very enjoyable. All right. All right. Have, a great, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.